exit light, enter night, take my hand off to Never Never Land. I'm sorry, I'm being told that's the wrong Sandman. Hi, I'm Andrew. Welcome to Splash Page. Today we are talking about Neil Gaiman's Sandman series from 1989. It was one of those things people would always say, this book is amazing, and you would know it was kind of out there in the zeitgeist. This is one of those quintessential comic books, and I just never read it. It was like I was waiting for the right moment to put the correct amount of effort into the book, to really focus. And then there was also that thought of, well, it's probably overhyped, right? It can't be as good as everyone says it is. And if it was really any good, they'd make a TV show out of it, right? Well, thank you, Netflix. And I can now say that I was wrong. It is not overhyped. Above the great story writing, which, what else you could expect from Neil Gaiman, who wrote American Gods, and all that great lore, and big ideas, there's fantastic art throughout. And something I never even think about, even though I know I really should, the lettering in this book is phenomenal. The first issue of Sandman might be the most dense comic book I've ever read. It's a 40-page book. It covers 72 years. And there's a lot of mystery going on. We're not even sure who it is we're reading about for the majority of the book. And it feels like they check in every couple of years. And it could get a little overwhelming. But uh, on a second read, I just let it wash over me. And it was really, really great. And the rest of the book flows very nicely. And I love it. And what the hell? Let's get into issue one of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. We begin in Witch Cross, England, 1916. The artwork here feels old, and not as an old artwork, like it still looks fresh, but old in that wealthy British turn of the century type of old. Large mansions, gargoyles sitting atop pointed metal gates, bald men with odd amounts of facial hair wearing bowler hats and top hats. A sense of mystery in the occult as we, along with Dr. John Hathaway, a museum curator, meet Mr. Roderick Burgess. A bald man with a big nose and a first name that barely even exists anymore. Who looks like someone barely getting away with a scam as he accepts a book from his visitor. The book is called the Magdalen Grimoire. A grimoire on its own is kind of like a magical textbook. Uh, filled with spells and supernatural beings of the occult. The book never tells us who Magdalen is in this scenario. But it could be one of a couple things. It could be directly related to Mary Magdalene, one of the first followers of Christ. Or it could be anyone from the city of Magdala. Or it could be the original meaning of the word, which means watcher or watchtower. Or it could mean none of those and just kind of have that biblical feeling that Gaiman loves oh so much. Either way, the scrawny, scared-looking man, Hathaway, hands over the book to Burgess, in the hopes that Burgess can use its magic to bring back his dead son. Hathaway doesn't realize this at the time, but Burgess has no intention of bringing back Hathaway's son. He's got his own ideas about power and death. The story then jumps four days into the future to June 10th, 1916. We see snippets of everyday people, and throughout the issue, we'll come back to these people to kind of see what's going on in the rest of the world. They're kind of our proxy to the rest of the world. Ellie Marston is frightened by a bedtime story. Daniel Bustamont dreams of a castle made of clouds. Stefan Wasserman, a child, fights in World War I in Verdun, France. And in London, England, Unity Kincaid dreams of a tall, dark man whose eyes burn like twin stars in his head. Later, we'll learn that the man she's dreaming of is actually Dream. Back in Witch Cross, England, Roderick Burgess, his son Alex, and the Order of the Ancient Mysteries, a cult-like group he's formed, begin a ceremony. The artwork here is dark and gothic, shadowed in mystery and the occult. Their goal? To summon the Reaper, Death himself, and trap him, use him for their own means. But something goes wrong. Instead of death, they've captured someone, something else. Inside the circle appears a humanoid wearing a cape and what looks like an old World War I gas mask. 
Despite not having summoned death itself, Roderick Burgess uses the crystal to trap whatever it is they've summoned. Burgess is not a man to let opportunity slip past him. Now let's check in on what's happening in the rest of the world now that they've captured what we'll find out is Dream. Ellie Marston falls asleep. She never wakes up. Daniel Bustamont's dream of a castle made of clouds falls apart, and he can't fall asleep anymore. Stefan Wasserman, the soldier, sits awake in a medical tent, not sleeping or speaking, having waking nightmares. And Unity Kincaid sleeps a dreamless sleep. Something is happening in the world, and it's affecting sleeping and dreaming. Burgess arrives at the prison he created for the creature, surrounded by his men. We see from inside the crystal his distorted face, his nose larger, more bulbous, as he threatens the creature he's captured. The creature, in a black bubble and white lettering, waits. He knows he has more time than his captors. We jump four years into the future, to the Royal Museum, where Dr. Hathaway, the man who first handed over the grimoire, works. Books and manuscripts are missing. Dr. Hathaway is suspected. He's been stealing or helping to steal valuable artifacts to hand over to Burgess in his Order of the Ancient Mysteries. Too late, perhaps, he realizes what he's gotten himself into and seeks to end it, writing a suicide note explaining all, using a museum artifact to kill himself. But Burgess can see what his puppet is doing through the magic of a crystal ball, and as Hathaway dies, he sees his confession go up in flames. It's too late for Hathaway, and as he dies, he knows no one will ever find out the truth. In the rest of the world, people are succumbing to what is being called the sleepy sickness. People fall asleep and they do not wake up. Many guesses are made as to what's causing it, but no one knows for sure. And Stefan Wasserman, he killed himself a year after being discharged from the army. Whether or not he was awake at the time, we aren't told. Six years later, in 1926, Roderick Burgess's son Alex finally figures out who it is they've captured. A drawing in a book of magic called the Paginarum Fulvarum, and roughly translates from Latin as the Yellow Pages, shows a picture of a man in a mask that looks exactly the same as the one on the man they captured. We now know that the man they captured is Dream, one of the Endless. At this point in the story, we don't know how many Endless there are, but later we find out that there are seven, which include Dream, Death, Destiny, and Desire, at the very least. Four years later, 1930. Roderick Burgess's second-in-command, Ruthven Sykes, absconds with Burgess's mistress and many of the artifacts of the Order of Ancient Mysteries had collected over the years. He uses one of these artifacts, a helmet, the one Dream was wearing when he was captured, to trade with a demon for an amulet of protection. When Burgess tries to harm Sykes in a ceremony involving the sacrifice of a cat, he finds that Sykes is protected. His son Alex suggests that they try to get their prisoner, Dream, to do something about Sykes, but Roderick admits that he has no power to make Dream do anything. It takes six more years until his old mistress walks out on Sykes, taking with her the Amulet of Protection. And in that moment, just as Sykes realizes what he's lost, his head explodes. Thanks to dark magic set in motion by Roderick Burgess. Three years after that, in 1939, we check in with humanity's proxies. Ellie Marston woke up twice in the last 10 years, crying for her mother. Daniel Bustamont finally fell asleep in 1926, and has been asleep for 13 years. And Unity Kincaid, still unconscious and dreamless, is raped and gives birth to a daughter, all without waking up. The child is gonna come back later in the story, and she's gonna have some meaning to the events that are going on. But we'll get to that in future issues. And elsewhere, a man dresses up in a cape and a mask. He goes out at night and fights evil. Let's take a quick sidetrack into DC Comics history and the history of the original Sandman. The man here is Wesley Dodds, the first Sandman, created by Gardner Fox and Burt Christman, way back in the 1930s. 
Dodds and Sandman would prowl the streets in a World War I gas mask, sedating criminals with sleeping gas. We'll get back to him in future issues, but I just want to say here that this was kind of a brilliant way of reimagining the original Sandman storyline and fitting it into the storyline of this book. When Neil Gaiman first pitched the idea of redoing the 1974 version of the Sandman, DC's editor Karen Berger told him, We'd like a new Sandman, keep the name, but the rest is up to you. So while the Sandman here, represented by Dream, bears no resemblance whatsoever to the original DC character, the Sandman, Gaiman was able to figure out a way to retcon his storyline back into this comic. All right, let's get back into the book. Let's jump ahead to 1947. Roderick Burgess is getting old. He takes his son Alex to the prison they've made for Dream. He storms in, angry, then breaks down and cries. Everything he's tried to do, everything he's wanted for all these years, and he cannot make this creature do his bidding, despite having had him locked up for over 30 years. From inside his captivity, Dream watches Roderick Burgess break down and finds no satisfaction in outliving his captor. He still waits. Later that year, Roderick Burgess dies. 1955, we check in again with the rest of the world. Not surprisingly, Ellie Marston still sleeps, though she wakes up a few times a year and asks for someone to read her a bedtime story like her mother did when she was young. Daniel Bustamont is the opposite. He almost never sleeps, but he doesn't speak either. He walks through the world like a zombie. And Unity Kincaid sleeps her life away in a wheelchair at a nursing home, where they wheel her around and pretend like everything is normal. Alex, Roderick's son, has taken over the Order of Ancient Mysteries from his father. His second-in-command, Paul McGuire, asks why he still keeps the creature trapped in the basement. Alex explains, how do you even let him out? What do you say? It wasn't me, it was my father. How do you shoot the devil in the back? What if you miss? Paul lets the subject go, accepting that they'll just keep him down there until after Alex dies and leaves the problem to someone else. That someone else just so happens will become Paul, but we'll get to that later also. In the basement, Alex offers Dream his freedom in exchange for power, immortality, and a promise not to seek revenge, same as his father offered. In frustration, he yells to Dream, Say something! Finally, for the first time, the creature speaks. He simply says, No. It's 1968, and everything is the same. Alex has aged. He runs the order, but he's less strict than his father was. Ellie and Unity still sleep. Daniel still wanders wordlessly. We check in on the guards watching the supernatural creature, hopped up on caffeine and amphetamines to keep them awake. We don't want anyone dreaming around Dream of the Endless, do we? Who knows what he can do? In 1970, Alex hands over the order to Paul McGuire, his second-in-command. Paul doesn't believe in magic and only uses the order to scam people out of their money, while Alex hides himself away writing books and articles defending his father's reputation. A son who knows the family has failed at all it tried, but needs to make himself feel like it was all worthwhile, the years of waiting, winning nothing. He doesn't read the books on magic anymore, only pours over the one page, the page on Dream. Over the years, he comes back to the cage, begs, threatens, cajoles, all to no avail. One night in 1988, Paul wheels Alex out of the cell. One of the two guards shuts his eyes for just a moment, dreams of his upcoming vacation. This was the opening Dream had been waiting for, for all of these years. Dream collapses in his crystal cage. The guards call for Paul McGuire to come and see. They open the lock, and Dream wakes up. He blows sand in their eyes, and they fall asleep. Naked but free, Dream leaves the world he spent trapped in for the last 72 years and re-enters the land of dreams, home. He travels through the dreams of others, finding food, 
clothing, but he needs his tools stolen from him by Roderick Burgess so many years ago. Once he has his tools, he can finally take revenge on his captors. And we check in once again with the rest of the world. Now the dream is free. Everyone starts waking up. The sleepy sickness is ending. Unity, Ellie, and the rest of the world wake up. Daniel Bustamont learns to speak again. Alex Burgess, old and frail, sleeps in his room. He dreams of a cat, follows it to a throne room, where the cat transforms into dream. Alex freaks out, apologizes, says all of the things he told Paul McGuire so many years ago would not work. And they don't. He tells Dream it was all a big mistake. They didn't want him. They wanted death. Dream lets him know how lucky they were to have failed in their original plan. He asks for his tools and learns that they were stolen years ago by Ruthven Sykes, his father's second-in-command, back in 1930, almost 60 years ago. Knowing that he has a trial ahead of him to find his tools, he takes his revenge. Not on Roderick Burgess, who's already dead, but on his son, Alex, who kept him locked up. He gifts Alex with eternal waking, which in this case appears to be eternal sleep while in his dreams, believing he's in a waking nightmare, unable to wake up from it. Dream has finally taken his revenge on his captors, the Burgesses, leaving Alex mumbling in fear, forever asleep, believing he's awake, living out his worst nightmares. Okay, so we went through a lot in that book. Beginning in 1916 with the kidnapping of the anthropomorphic representation of Dream, all the way to his release in 1988, 72 years later. But Dream is nothing if not patient. He was here before us, and he'll be here until his job is done, well after we're gone. We got to see what was happening in the rest of the world. Why most people slept, but others didn't, the book never really explains. It only goes to show that I guess some people react differently to different influences. One thing I'll always say about Neil Gaiman, I love his writing. The way he seems to carefully choose each and every word to give you the feeling that things are more mysterious and more important than they might appear at first. And if this first issue is anything to go by, and spoiler alert, it is, the artwork throughout the rest of the series is going to be amazing. So, thanks for watching. This was the recap of issue one of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. When the Netflix show comes out later this year, we'll be doing reviews of the TV show as well, comparing it to the books, and going deeper into some of the mystery and lore of The Sandman books. Until then, I'm Andrew, this is Splash Page, and I'll see you in the next video.